Story number one, Husky Pants. When I was little, I was chubby. I'm still chubby. My nickname was Pooh Bear. My mom and I were also poor. So at the beginning of each school year, my mom would take me shopping at the discount clothing shop called Playtox, where the town's poor families waded through huge crates of off-brand, slightly damaged clothes to find their kids' pants and shirts. I remember that none of the normal pants in the crates fit me, so we'd have to go to the jeans section of the store marked Husky. I always hated the word Husky. No eight-year-old girl in love with unicorns and holly hobby prints wants to be called Husky. As a kid, I was teased and bullied and mocked for being pudgy and chubby. I was also called Fatso and Piggy and once a tub of lard. Mean little boys threw nasty names at me and also rocks and sticks. I was always picked last for kickball games and girls made fun of my ill-fitting husky clothes. But I was also brainy and so I learned that if you could make people laugh, if you made jokes and acted crazy fun, people wouldn't try to hurt you and maybe they'd even enjoy you being around. So I became the funny chubby kid, the smart aleck, the wisecracker, cutting up and cheering up others. Being chubby made me othered, and it gave me permission to see other kids being othered in a sympathetic light. I always had friends in the cool kids camp, because I was fun. But I retained my membership card for the camps where the geeks and the underdogs lived too. Story number two, child of trauma. Being funny also helped make my mother laugh and help me feel wanted and lovable at home. My mother was an angry woman. She had had a tough life. She'd experienced violence and devastating hardships throughout her life. So she often expressed her frustration and her pain in violent ways. The physical abuse that I experienced during my childhood made me feel powerless. And this powerlessness only abated during those moments I could please my mother, especially with hilarious storytelling, humorous impressions, and wacky antics. Her laughter made me feel safer, made me feel wanted and seen. What was not permitted in my home was dissent or expressing frustration at injustice. My mother never allowed me to show my anger or speak up for myself. If I did, I was dismissed or harmed. My mother saw disagreement as a challenge to her control and her authority. This trauma installed in me two things, a great desire to speak up when I see injustice and a deep compassion for anyone else who feels that they are being silenced. Today, my work, my teaching, my activism, my research interests center on those who speak truth to power because as a child, I could never speak to my abusive single parent. I could never speak up to anyone about any of my feelings of fear or rage or my helplessness. So I've devoted my academic life to teaching about the history of power politics through resistance, agency, resilience. I teach about colonialism, racism, slavery, and liberation. Story three, avoiding Americans. During my school days, I never dated or even thought about dating. I was chubby and I lacked self-esteem because of that and because of my abusive home life. I spent a lot of time being very academic and achieving extracurricular recognition, but I always felt unlovable, unworthy, unwanted. When I did finally fall in love my first year of college, I fell hard for an Indian boy. Like the quiet, sensitive little Filipino boy I had had a crush on in kindergarten many years earlier, this boy was kind and gentle. He was from a far off place. And I think I imagined that people in distant lands were not superficial and mean like boys in America. While this boy never reciprocated my romantic feelings, we were best friends and he opened my heart to a whole new world 
the lore of international cultures, exotic music, Hinduism, foreign food, world history, and a desire to travel and see it all. My first boyfriend my senior year in college was Japanese. And in the years that followed, I would also have a string of global lovers, a Frenchman, a Czech, an Algerian Muslim, and many more Indians, mostly living here in the States, mostly because they had been othered, othered by their accents, othered by their skin color, othered by their faith or their immigrant status. I think I hoped foreign men would find me as exciting and interesting as I found them, and we could help each other navigate being othered. I also think it helped me feel more woke because I was dating people of color. I was loving beyond borders and social norms. In other ways, I think avoiding Americans was my way of avoiding the trauma I experienced as a little girl. Picking men who were othered in our society helped me feel like I was saving them from harm and saving myself, maybe, at the same time. Story four, multiracial momming. Understanding othering has taken a new level of depth since having a husband who is not white, who might be mistaken actually for a black man in many parts of this country, and also having a multiracial child who passes as white, but who may fall victim to othering in other ways. Being part of a multiracial nuclear family makes me more aware of social and cultural differences every single day. I live with someone from another culture and someone who has felt unsafe here in his own skin, in my town, even in the white neighborhood we've chosen to live in. He and I, he and I have had many conversations about the lack of diversity in our child's life, in her daycare facility, other places, and the adverse effects that will have on her identity. In India, people stare at us and our child. In America, we've felt judged and othered. We surround ourselves with multiracial friends and families for our own solidarity and for our child's education. We want people to know there are families that look like ours. We teach Pema about how families like ours were othered by law, by violence, by mean people who don't want people with different skin colors loving each other because it scares them. As a white wife to an Indian husband and a white mom to a multiracial child, you see the world differently. Often I ask myself, do I have the right to speak for them? Can I share their stories? Be a voice for them? What does it mean in my skin to be an ally, an advocate, an activist? What obligations do I have to speak truth to power as someone so intimately connected to those who have been and may continue to be othered. I don't know the right answer, but I know my feelings. Being close to those who have been othered gives me a different awareness of othering, causing me to ask, what are my responsibilities and what work have I still to do? Join us now for a conversation about the stories that we've shared and the questions they evoke. Who gets to voice what, for whom, how, when, where, and why?